pretty sir lay there Did on tell it did tear Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coeur. You said that you want Congress to close some of the polls. With that, you also said that you want to make this work. Now, are these kids being used as pawns for a wall? Many people are asking that, and Democrats are saying this is your discretion, and there is no law that says that this White House can separate parents from the children. The kids are being used by pawns, by the smugglers and the traffickers. Again, let, let's just pause to think about this statistic. 314% increase in adults showing up with kids that are not a family unit. Those are traffickers, those are smugglers, that is MS-13, those are criminals, those are abusers. So, thank you. All I'm trying to say is... The closing that loophole will enable us to detain families together throughout the proceeding as they've done in previous administrations. Madam Secretary, Madam Secretary, can you definitively say, are the children being used as pawns against the uh, a four wall? Yes or no? Can you say yes or no to that? The children are not being used as a pawn. We are trying to protect the children, which is why I'm asking Congress to act. Yes. Yes. How is this not child abuse? Which be more specific, please. Enforcing the law? The images that Cecilia was talking about and the sounds that we've seen uh, from these big box stores, the Walmarts, the other stores, when you see this, how is this not specifically child abuse for these innocent children who are indeed being separated from their parents? So I want to be couple clear on a couple other things. The vast majority, vast, vast majority of children who are in the care of HHS right now, 10,000 of the 12,000, were sent here alone by their parents. That's when they were separated. So somehow we've conflated everything, but there's two separate issues. 10,000 of those currently in custody were sent by their parents with strangers to undertake a completely dangerous and deadly travel alone. We now care for them. We have high standards. We give them meals. We give them education. We give them medical care. There's videos. There's TVs. I visited the detention centers myself. That would be my answer to that question. Yes. If I could follow up, for the, for the hundreds that are not included in there, you said 10,000, but for the hundreds that we have seen, perhaps up to 2,000, is there are there any examples of child abuse, you believe? And how could this not be child abuse for the people who are taken from their parents? Not the ones who are sent here with their parents' blessing with the smugglers, and the people who are taken from their parents. I, unfortunately, I'm not in any position to deal with, uh, you know, hearsay stories. If someone has a specific allegation, as I always do when I testify, I ask that they provide that information to the Department of Homeland Security. We will look into it. It is Tuesday, the 19th of June of 2018. That's right, Juneteenth, folks. In West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, Juneteenth, should be a national holiday, and we will make it so. Yes, we will. In time. Well, folks, I feel so much better today. Uh, the fix that the doctor gave me seems to be working, and I'm knocking on wood because, uh, you know, I feel better. And I don't want it to be a false promise. But uh, I'm pretty in tune with the workings of my body and from being an, an athlete and, and other things in my life. So, um, yeah, I feel so much better. Sorry for the uh, relatively uh, down tone yesterday 
I was uh, struggling to get through the show because the show must go on. All right. Got a little bit of a late start here uh, getting the show ready. Uh, lots of interruptions, and uh, I don't know why. I, it's, it's, a, it's as if, you know, everything is forgotten. And it probably was. So <laughs> we'll, we'll avoid that discussion. It's a little too personal. All right. Well, uh, what do we have on store for today? That was Bridget Nielsen, DHS secretary, by the way, called in to uh, fill in for Sarah Sanders because, uh, you know, it's, it's the kids that she's uh, incarcerating. Oh, it's not incarcerating, but she had no real answers. To serious questions about government sanctioned child abuse because that is exactly what it is and that is exactly what Stephen Miller wants he wants these children to be abused first of all because he's a racist slug and that's been uh, documented since his time at Santa Monica High a little racist thug and um, uh, he also likes the chaos it engenders because you know we're making the left mad you ever get that online where they just want to jab you and then they, they laugh and glee? Oh, the greatest thing we can do is just like cause these liberals to get upset. I mean, that's their goal in life. How about filling a pothole? That would be nice. But no, no, they won't do that. Okay. So what else do we have on the rest of the menu in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Mississippi's Republican governor is ensnared in a prost in a post-Brexit lawsuit, photos displayed in the West Wing of Trump and French President Emmanuel Macron have been replaced with gold-framed photos of Kim Jong-un, and Trump is busted lying about Germany and his unpopularity there only helps Angela Merkel. Okay, we're getting lots of uh, interruptions here today. I apologize. Darn this world. After the break, we'll then move to the chef's table, where an independent global research project found Americans own nearly half the world's guns that are in civilian hands. And countering terrorism in Saudi Arabia becomes a chimera for rights abuses. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. the bottom of our homepage at netroofsradio.com, you'll notice the chat room link at the rightish of the page. Kelly Lincoln, our roaring girl, takes care of that. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of, of our homepage at netrootsradio.com are the uh, contribute donate buttons. And thank you for your generosity. We are unable to do this without you. And you can follow uh, Net. Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that platform. I'm supposed to take care of Facebook, but I basically let Facebook take care of itself there. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I also post the show notes and links on Daily Co's, and I can be found there as Justice Putnam. And uh, do take a gander at our Twitter feed for uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. For some reason, the algorithm gave us the email or the Twitter feed at Cookbook West at Cookbook West. All right, so there's that. You can also get podcasts of the show uh, by way of Stitcher, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and and other places too. All right. Okay, so let's look at this first uh, article here about uh, Mississippi. Hey, Ole Miss. There's something uh, that the uh, Russians, a lot of Russians in Ole Miss. How did that happen? Well, a new lawsuit shines a light on how Brexiteers developed a strange partnership at Ole Miss. This is by Casey Michelle out of Think Progress. 
From London to Moscow to Brussels, the ongoing debate surrounding Brexit and the forces backing Britain's departure from the European Union has reached many different locales. Now it seems we can add Mississippi to the list. A lawsuit filed earlier this year has roped both the state and its republic. Republican governor into lingering questions about how the Leave campaign accumulated voter data as well as which laws may have been broken along the way. Namely, did Brexit backers illegally ship British citizens' data overseas? And if so, what were they planning on doing with it moving forward? The lawsuit was filed by UK resident Kyle Taylor, a dual American British national, and the Pair Vote Project, and alleges that a pair of British firms may have obtained social media users' information and illegally sent that information to partners in Mississippi. Earlier this year, Brittany Kaiser, a former employee of the much maligned Cambridge Analytica firm, testified before the British Parliament and said that during her time. With Cambridge Analytica, she had been made aware of another data company known as Big Data Dolphins. That company was started by Eldon Insurance, owned by Aaron Banks, the leading Brexit donor whose unreported contacts with Russian officials recently came to light following a series of published emails. According to Kaiser, Big Data Dolphins has reportedly worked with a data science team at Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. Wow, I wonder how much money the Federalist Society and Koch brothers have there too. The mind reels trying to consider it. If the Mississippi team is held or promised UK citizens' data in the U.S., I believe that is likely to be a criminal offense. Although it is for the empowered authorities to pursue any such question and secure the associated evidence. Now that was by Brittany Kaiser. Both Big Data Dolphins and Eldon Insurance have denied that any data was ever transferred to the University of Mississippi, and the university has likewise denied any allegations. Well, that's what they said over there in Britain too, didn't they? About their colleges, Cambridge. Uh, but uh, Taylor, the plaintiff in the ongoing suit, has said he believes Kaiser's suspicions will be borne out, and that the lawsuit will help confirm such allegations. He has asked the presiding judge to help prevent either company from destroying any related data. Okay, well, let's see. The Men of Mississippi, the partnership to which Kaiser alluded, and that is now the subject of a lawsuit in Mississippi, stems from the one of the stranger relationships that have developed over the past few years between transatlantic populace. And just yesterday, Stephen Miller was extolling what great stuff is happening with these right-wing white nationalist populist movements popping up all over the world. He says it shows their dominance and preeminence. Hmm. I think it's just the squeaky wheel gets the grease. All right. Despite having little official reason to build a relationship, Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant, Republican, and Brexit leader Nigel Farage had developed a friendly relationship since at least 2016. The two apparently first started buddying up during Trump's presidential campaign, campaign and have had numerous meetings in the time since. For good measure, Bryant was the one who invited Farage to Trump's inauguration and, according to uh, uh, news reports, even introduced Farage to Trump right here in Jackson. Farage apparently returned the favor, helping Bryant make the rounds with others, helping fund the Brexit campaign, including Aaron Banks. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay, after uh, the Brexit vote, uh, Bryant shepherded a proposed partnership between Eldon Insurance and the University of Mississippi to set up an artificial intelligence team in Oxford, Mississippi. Wow. You got Cambridge and you got Cambridge. All right. As an April statement from Bryant's office read, upon learning that Eldon Insurance was planning to begin a new research effort at the University of Scotland, Governor Bryant suggested to Eldon leadership they should look into research at the Mississippi University, at a Mississippi University, maybe just like Ole Miss. We could do it just right at Ole Miss. Well, I think they did. The Clarion Ledger also reported that Bryant pitched the idea to Andrew Wigmore, 
another pro-Brexit figure whose unreported meetings with Russian officials were only reported last week following email revelations. As emails later re revealed, banks requested that the Mississippi office establish a marketing-focused AI office with data scientists, marketing, marketing execs, and a psychologist working on projects to disrupt the market. Sounds like propaganda in a way, huh? Sounds like mind control. Oh yeah, that's advertising. I keep forgetting. Elizabeth Pressa out of Alternet uh, penned this next offering here at the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Several garish gold frames having in the West Wing. What? Several garish gold frames in the West Wing that used to be adorned with pictures of Donald Trump and French President Emmanuel Macron have been replaced with photos from the President's Summit with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Yeah. Well, Wall Street Journal reporter uh, Michael Bender reported this because he was there. In April, Trump and Macron's friendship appeared to reach new heights during a state dinner, and the French president pra praised their great relationship, and Trump offered to wipe dandruff off Macron's shoulder in sort of like a silverback ape uh, uh, display of dominance. So, I mean, come on. Really? But at the G7 meeting in June, their union reportedly soured. Trump, who was more than an hour late with his scheduled meeting with Macron, left the G7 for Singapore, where he met with Jong Un and offered praise for the North Korean leader. Well, you know, because Macron really hasn't killed anybody in his country. Trump wants to kill people in this country on the scale of a Kim Jong-un. You didn't praise me. You are now dead. Bring on the dogs. <laughs> do you have any doubt in your mind that he would do that? Of course he would. He fantasizes about it. He gets a hard on about it. He's only told us and showed us repeatedly. It's really sick. When you take over a country, a tough country, tough people, and you take it over from your father, I don't care who you are, what you are, how much of an advantage you have. If you can do that at 27, year old, 27 years old, I mean, that's one in 10,000 that could do that. What? He just praised a murderous tyrant. Well, because he wants to be one now, doesn't he? Finishing up here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an article out of Raw Story by Bob Brigham. It uh, looks like uh, Donald Trump is caught lying about Germany. And yeah, they don't like that. They don't. On Monday, Trump made clearly false claims about Germany, which will likely only buttress support for Chancellor Angela Merkel. Trump made three claims about Germany. He said, uh, or tweeted, The people of Germany are turning against their leadership as migration is rocking the already tenuous Berlin coalition. He didn't write tenuous. That's Stephen Miller. 
Well, Jeremy Cliff, the Bureau, Berlin bureau chief for The Economist, reminded that, well, Burkle remains the most popular politician in Germany. Yeah, but Trump's voters don't know that. And if they did, they wouldn't care. Ironically, Trump tweeting against Merkel actually shores up her domestic political support. The U.S. president's intervention could be useful domestically for Ms. Merkel because of his unpopularity. Just 11% of Germany has a favorable view of Mr. Trump, according to research by Polster Pew for the Germany public broadcaster Deutsche Welle. In fact, Trump may have just thrown Merkel a life preserver. Now, he's trying to do Putin's work, but he's such an idiot. He doesn't do nuance now, does he? No, he doesn't. Nice of the president to help Angela Merkel by giving her exactly what she needed politically, a Trump endorsement of her opponents, explained Hudson Institute fellow Benjamin Haddad. Now, Trump's second claim was that crime in Germany is way up. Like all those little four-year-olds, two-year-olds, 18-month-olds, all those little six-month-olds ripped from their mother breastfeeding, they're all MS-13. Yeah, crime is up. No, it's not. Reuters national security correspondent Jonathan Landay explained how thoroughly Trump had misrepresented crime in Germany. This is another lie by Trump, Landre reported. Crime is at a 30-year low in Germany. 30-year low. And this is, get this, this is with all these asylum seekers coming into uh, Germany and increasing the population. And we're not talking percentages. Actual crime has gone down as more asylum seekers have been allowed in. How is that possible? Well, because, I don't know, maybe everybody wants to help everybody. And those who are being helped feel grateful for that. And they they uh, return the favor. Maybe that's it. Except there's always a few who want to disrupt things because they don't like brown people of any you. Now, Trump's third claim was that it was a big mistake made all over Europe and allowing millions of people in who have so strongly and violently changed their culture. Zieg Heil, Herr Trump. That's exactly what Goebbels and Goering and one Adolf used to intone constantly. They changed our culture. The Jews have changed our culture. This, this vile, debased art has changed our culture. These books, these liberal communist books have changed our culture. That asylum seeker. That child has changed our culture. Under Merkel, Germany opened its borders to welcome around one million asylum seekers in 2015. At times, more than 10,000 people were arriving daily in the country, which had a population of around 81 million. But according to official figures released last month, now this is NBC News reporting this, Germany last year recorded its lowest number of criminal offenses since 1992, with figures showing the crime rate is falling more quickly among non-German suspects. In other words, white Germans are more apt to commit a crime than their non-German brown counterparts. CNN political contributor Keith Boykin reminded how this particular lie has been used. Germany, last month, reported its lowest crime rate since 1992, Boykin reminded. Austrian-born Adolf Hitler also used lies and misinformation about crime to complain about groups of people in Germany who had changed their culture. And the host of the Michelangelo Signorelli show on Sirius XM had even harsher words. Crime is not up. This is another lie. And the last line is a chilling call to white supremacists, Signorelli observed. He's gone full-on Nazi. And what was uh, Signorelli referring to? Well, this tweet by Trump. 
The people of Germany are turning against their leadership, as migration is rocking the already tenuous Berlin coalition. Crime in Germany is way up. Big mistake made all over Europe in allowing millions of people in who have so strongly and violently changed their culture. Indeed, Herr Trump. Okay, well, uh, I guess we're going to have to get off to our break. Maybe a tad early. Maybe we're right on. We'll have to see. (laughs) And uh, we'll come back and uh, go through weather from around the world. And then we'll finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, Soaring While Going Under. The new Shailene Woodley vehicle, Adrift, certainly isn't a journey into uncharted genres. It joins All is Lost, Life of Pi, and lots of others in the Lost at Sea category. One reason these films keep getting done is that there is a minimalist elemental appeal to the stripped-down man, or in this case notably, woman versus nature tale. As real events of this sort are usually not complicated, the films they spawn can concentrate on basic film elements. Set in 1983 and based on a true story, Adrift is the chronicle of Woodley's character Tammy, a wandering 20-something who drifts into Tahiti, where she meets and quickly falls for a shipbuilder and fellow wanderer Richard, a decade or two her senior, and played by British heartthrob Sam Claflin. In need of funds, the two take a job delivering a 50-foot luxury yacht to San Diego, a nice gig, until they run into a hurricane in the middle of the Pacific. Now, you're not aware of this backstory in the first scene, as that is of Tammy waking up alone and injured in the bowels of the wrecked ship. The story unfolds in nonlinear fashion, which makes it easier to slip in the shocker when the time comes, and also serves to enhance suspense, as director Balthazar Cormacur has the knack for placing the flashbacks. It shouldn't be a secret why Woodley, who's also credited as a producer here, was drawn to the role. It's a continuation of her earlier work as resourceful, powerful female leads. But here, one being tested like never before and emerging somehow more grown up. And this note, to enhance your viewing of Adrift, avoid the temptation to Google news accounts of the original story and let Woodley's Tammy impress as intended. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. 39 years ago, Voyager 1 swung by Jupiter on its journey to interstellar space. And as it did, it picked up spooky, low-frequency radio signals like this. The whistlers, as they're known, were radio broadcasts from unusual natural antennas, lightning bolts, which act like radio transmitters with current moving through a channel. Along with photos of the dark side of the planet, the Whistlers confirmed the existence of lightning on Jupiter. But the limited observations made it hard to pin down where electrical storms gathered, and the bolts were thought to be rare compared to Earth. Now the Juno spacecraft has detected the first high-frequency radio signals and 1,600 new Whistlers which together suggests lightning on Jupiter, is much more common than scientists thought, and a lot more similar to Earth lightning, too. The discharges also appear to be between clouds containing liquid water and others containing water ice, the same kind of conditions for cloud-to-cloud lightning here on Earth. The findings appear in the journals Nature and Nature Astronomy. There is one twist to this Jovian weather story, though. Jupiter's lightning storms congregate near the planet's poles, not its equator, That's the opposite of Earth, and a detail that makes this familiar phenomenon still seem a bit otherworldly. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
Pools, water parks, and other recreational water venues are popular places to relax and stay cool, but they can be sources of serious illness. Since 2000, nearly 500 outbreaks have been reported at recreational water venues in the U.S., resulting in over 27,000 illnesses and eight deaths. Most were caused by parasites, bacteria, viruses, or certain chemicals in the water. Parents with young children who have diarrhea should not allow their children to swim or play in the water. In addition, bathers should check the inspection scores of pools and water parks and can conduct mini inspections using test strips before getting in the water. A few simple precautions can allow you to share the fun, not the germs. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. In August of 1963, thousands of Americans marched in Washington, D.C. They wanted to show their support for the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an important civil rights leader. It was there that Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. After a day of speeches, prayer, and songs, the march's organizers met with President John F. Kennedy. Kennedy announced that he would ask Congress to enact major new civil rights legislation. He was assassinated three months later. The task of pushing for the legislation fell to his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson. In 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended segregation in public places, such as restaurants and hotels. The law also said that employers could not discriminate against people because of their race, national origin, religion, or gender. When African Americans won these civil rights after years of struggle, other groups began to call for equal protection. Women, disabled people, older people, Native Americans, and many other groups worked to get laws passed guaranteeing their right to equal protection of the laws. In response to their efforts, Congress and state legislatures have passed laws prohibiting unfair discrimination against these groups. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1933. That was the day President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Tennessee Valley Authority Act. The act created the TVA as a federal corporation and was tasked to address the resource development of the region, one of the poorest in the nation. These included flood control and improved travel along the Tennessee River. It also meant improved forestry to address soil erosion and facilitation of agricultural production. Control of water resources required a series of dams designed to navigate the river and reduce flooding. Though Wilson Dam had been completed before the establishment of the TVA, the authority had embarked on the construction of 16 more dams. During the Depression, the TVA hired tens of thousands of workers for conservation, construction, and development. Historian Eric Loomis notes that though the TVA was one of the region's largest employers of black workers, the authority also made maintained rigid lines of segregation in its workforce. He adds that though 14 AFL unions eventually worked on dam construction, the agency initially refused to recognize unions. Workers would have to wait until 1940 to sign first contracts in the anti-union South. Today, the authority is most well known for its supply of electricity to nearby communities. It is the nation's largest public power company and serves about 80,000 square miles in the southeastern United States. TVA capacity to generate electric power includes some 29 hydroelectric dams, 11 coal-fired power plants, three nuclear plants, and several combustion turbine installations. It also has several solar and wind installations. The authority produces more than 130 billion kilowatt hours of electricity each year. The TVA played a critical role in transforming the South by constructing infrastructure necessary for modernization and industrialization. You can help stop the Trump agenda in its tracks. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. And on November 6th, vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of NetrootsRadio.com. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. I'm Sue Marie Ainsborough. 
Hundreds of unionists from around the world are in Liverpool this week for the Congress of Uni Global Union. Uni is the global union for skills and services with 20 million members in a wide range of sectors, including finance, IT, media, hair and beauty, tourism, sports, and garment production. The Congress will run from June 17th to 20th. It began with more than 600 delegates attending Uni's World Women's Conference. Christy Hoffman, who has been nominated to be Uni's General Secretary, spoke to the delegates and emphasized the need to address sexual harassment in the workplace. We've been all talking about sexual harassment for a very long time. It's been on my personal hit list since almost exactly 40 years ago, when on my first day of work in July 1978, my boss said he would only train me if I went in the back room and had sex with him. Well, over this period, the issue has gone up and down, it surfaced and then faded from view many times, and I would like to think that we've made incremental change, but probably we haven't. Now, a look at history tells us that change actually never happens incrementally. It normally happens at big bursts at a time. There's always a big burst of forward motion, and then progress usually gets pushed back a little bit, but... We don't normally win step by step as much as we like to believe that. And I believe that we're in one of those big bursts right now where the chasms have opened on sexual harassment. The opportunity is presenting itself for us to translate this renewed shock and outrage about sexual harassment into long-lasting progress and that we as union women should seize this opportunity before it's too late. Because we have to change the rules on sexual harassment, we have to change the culture. Now, let's just step back and, and what was the cause of this renewed, uh, you know, burst into the public eye. You know, the first thing happened when Donald Trump was running for president of the United States, and these disgusting remarks came to light about him grabbing women and forcing himself on women during the election campaign. And it was a big setback for women that so many people said, well, boys will be boys. Later in the year, news reports surfaced that some actresses claimed harassment and worse by a very famous movie producer. Now, one, some might wonder if movie actresses, famous ones, are afraid to come forward with these brutal actions of sexual misconduct and even rape. How could ordinary working women find the courage to do so? But such is the shame and fear attached to sexual harassment. Now, here is the challenge for us. It's really to make sure this moment does not only relate to women who work for bosses who are famous, such that they, they are about to lose their job if their misconduct becomes public. And I think it's our time to make big leaps forward for all working women. Because sexual harassment is pervasive, it's, there are many surveys out there, but most of them show that about half of working women report they've been victim of sexual harassment. That's in every country where there's been a service taken, half. And low-wage service jobs are the worst of all. So that's, our, that's us, everybody. So what can we do? One thing we can do, of course, is to try to make sexual harassment illegal in our countries. Many countries have done so but not all, and most of the laws don't really help us as much as we would like. Also, sisters, we are trade unionists. I believe in the union solution, and for all of us involved in collective bargaining, this is the time to put our most ambitious demands on the table. We should get a process with every employer. The process should protect people who come forward, and it should give some meaningful punishments for those who are the wrongdoers, but also it should be fair for everybody. This is the time, an unrivaled opportunity for us to get these provisions which can go beyond whatever our laws provide. The Uni World Congress runs until Wednesday, June 20th. I'm C. Marie Ainsborough. Thank you for listening. From Singapore, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Hours after President Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un last week, the press was treated to a look at a video entitled The Future Remains to be Written, 
What at first looked like North Korean propaganda was actually an American attempt to convince Kim to abandon nuclear aggression for, as Trump put it, the highest level of future development. If that was the instrument which was supposed to turn the tide on the negotiations and close the deal, we're in a pretty bad shape. Nicholas Eberstadt is a political economist at the American Enterprise Institute, and he studied the North Korean economy since the 1980s. Among the obstacles facing a North Korean economic renaissance is a caste system known as Songbun, in which the lower third of society is designated as hostiles. Whatever changes occur in North Korea, Eberstadt says making life better for them isn't on the agenda. The North Korean government has no interest at all in prosperity for its hostile classes. It doesn't want more options for those people. It wants to keep them in a box. There's also a statistical blackout in North Korea in which the government tightly guards all economic data, lest anything bad leak out that could cast the Kim regime in a bad light. That's helpful politically, but a major impediment to capitalist investment. Whether you are Milton Friedman or Joseph Stalin, you need to have accurate information to base economic calculations on. It's impossible to think of any modern economy operating in a statistical vacuum. And even if foreign investors overcame those hurdles, Eberstadt says it's worth remembering North Korean law makes capitalist enterprise illegal on paper and quasi-criminal in practice, allowing the state to take a major bite out of any profits. So a so-called capitalist flourishing in North Korea today just advances the timetable on being able to incinerate San Francisco. Luke Vargas, Singapore. Thank you for accompanying us to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Charter Tuesdays is our daily special on Juneteenth, folks. Happy Juneteenth. Well, uh, we like to begin with weather from around the world, and we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently, well, It is about 60 degrees right now, and we are slated to be a little warmer than yesterday. We're going to go up to about 90, 93. Winds will be light and variable, which they are right now out of the south. They will shift uh, out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour tonight, but will just remain light and variable through the day. Dry conditions will continue. Grass pollen is very high. The air quality index is pushing it is at the upper nether regions of good at 21 parts per million the uv daily in daytime index is still very high at nine so take care if you have that number in your area high pressure dominates at uh, 30 inches visibility is up to 10 miles and that relative humidity is down to 75 percent so yeah it'll be a bit dry i've been out watering early in the morning Trying to get that done. Yeah. Well, yeah it's probably not wise, even in warmer climates, to uh, to uh, water it at, in, in the evening or at night. Uh, I'm finding that my uh, my lawn uh, responds much better to just a watering in the morning. I, I've been reading that maybe that cold water, they don't like it at night. We'll see. I may have to change my mind about that. Okay, let's see. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal purchase weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. The guy just outside of London is recording uh, 75 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 76 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 86 and mostly cl- cloudy. Excuse me. Kiev is 85 and fair. Kabul is 79 degrees and partly cloudy. Hong Kong, 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Uh, Tokyo is 71 degrees and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 55 degrees 
with a rain shower. San Francisco, California is 52 degrees and cloudy, and they continue to have uh, gale force uh, gusts. Uh, small craft advisories on the bay and offshore. I watched the game last night. Uh, uh, played They played there at uh, the downtown stadium in San Francisco, AT&T Park. And uh, winds were blowing. So, God, I miss the bay. I have family members who, who have an obsession against the wind. Like the wind is something bad. And I'm like, boy, you've never been a sailor, have you? You want some wind. Yeah, you try to be out in the doldrums and you're not getting anywhere and you're thinking, boy, we just had a lick of wind. Yeah, well, I want more than a lick. I want an actual, you know, a puff. Give me a puff. All right. Well, that is weather from around the world. Oh, I forgot New York, New York. <laughs> you can't forget New York, New York. They're in. They're vying with Paris as being the center of the universe. I think Paris wins. I love New York, but I probably love Paris more. If truth be told. Okay. Uh, New York, New York is 83 degrees and partly cloudy. Is it getting humid already? I'm going to have to ask a rowing girl about that. Hey, that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase. These people planted these purchase personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. First article here at the Chef's Table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, is by anonymous worker bees at Reuters. Americans make up 4% of the world's population, but owned about 46% of the estimated 857 million weapons in civilian hands at the end of 2017 alone. The Small Arms Survey, an independent global research project based in Geneva, Switzerland, found that there were more than 1 billion firearms in the world, of which civilians owned 85%, while the rest were held by militaries or law enforcement agencies. The number of guns owned by civilians globally rose to 857 million in 2017 from 650 million in 2006. There were 120 guns... For every 100 U.S. citizens in 2017, it found, followed by Yemen with nearly 53 firearms per 100 people there. Hmm. The biggest force pushing up gun ownership around the world is civilian ownership in the U.S. Ordinary American people buy approximately 14 million new and imported guns every year. And why would the gun industry want to give that up? Why has any gun runner never wanted, well, you know, gun control? Why are they buying them? That's another debate. Above all, they are buying them probably because they can. And when you're told that MS-13 is going to kill you in your sleep and uh, rape your dead carcass, regardless of gender, you might need to buy a, an extra 17 guns uh, for 20 people in your community. A small arms survey said civilian firearms registration data was available for 133 countries and territories, but only 28 countries released information on their military stockpiles and law enforcement agencies. So there's even more out there. And this is only the ones that are legally registered. We're not talking about the guns sold at a gun show out the back of someone's, uh, uh, you know, trunk of their car. So maybe we need to add on another 800 million or so. Well, every figure published by the survey for 230 countries and territories includes some degree of estimation. Well, isn't that true in every survey? Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux 
Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Okay, finishing up here at the Chef's Table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an article out of Just Security by Ben Emerson QC and Fia Noella Ni Alwain. Saudi Arabia's drive to counter terrorism has become a convenient chimera to, cra- to su- <laughs> support crackdowns on legitimate public dissent and political or social activism of any kind. And the campaign has turned into an indiscriminate tool wielded to stigmatize critics of the state as terrorists. Sort of like, uh, you know, our uh, media are the enemy of the people. Kim Jong-un, who has uh, nuclear weapons pointed to the West Coast of the United States, he's a perfectly fine fellow. Very fine. Some very fine people there. The media, the liberals, oh, enemy of the people. Gee. It's like they they play they they have the same playbook, they play from it all of them. Uh, those are our conclusions based on research and two comprehensive visits to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, by one of us, Ben Emerson, while he was serving as the special rapporteur on promotion and protection of human rights while countering terrorism, an independent expert appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council. The findings are outlined in detail in a country report issued last week with co-author Fionawala Ni Alawain, his successor as Special Rapporteur. While expressing gratitude for the kingdom's transparency and courteous, constructive, and cooperative approach during the two visits, well, that was diplomatic now, wasn't it? The report articulates grave and sustained concerned concerns about Saudi Arabia's human rights record and makes clear that Saudi Arabia's practices are inconsistent with its treaty obligations. The results are clear and compelling changes, or the results call for clear and compelling changes all the more because this state occupies a seat on the Human Rights Council. I wonder how that happened. We apply both international human rights and humanitarian law to assess Saudi Arabia's human rights record and find that both bodies of law apply to the country's recent extraterritorial operations in Syria and Yemen. The report pays particular attention uh, to Saudi Arabia's counterterrorism legislation, the most significant of which is the law of terrorism crimes and its financing, which was approved by the king in December 2013 and entered into force on February 1st of 2014. Interior Ministry regulations issued on March 7th of 2014 extended the counterterrorism law's definition of terrorism by adding to the list of acts classed as terrorism. And they continued to add on to this law, so I guess even just uh, uh, turning away in disgust from a beheading of a woman driving a car without a shawl on, uh, that could... Con- could be construed as terrorism. Could be. The Interior Ministry's regulations uh, issued on March 7th of 2014 extended the counterterrorism's law, already overly broad definition of terrorism, to include such acts as calling for atheist thought in any form, calling into question the fundamentals of the Islamic religion on which this country is based. Wahhabi this, mofo. Wow. The definition also included anyone who had contact or correspondence with any groups, currents of thought, oh, you were on a chat room, and they were talking about the fundamental differences between, I don't know, whirling dervishes and uh, Wahhabis. You die. You terrorist. Well, so uh, the reporter the report continues that uh, it's, They are deeply concerned that the definition of terrorism in the 2014 law on counterterrorism and its financing is overly broad 
and fails to, to comply with international human rights standards. Well, of course. Uh, the article uh, and report goes on, and of course, all links are provided in my Daily Coast diary, so uh, check me out there at Justice Putnam. It's also, uh, by, I believe, the Justice Department on NetRootsRadio.com. I believe if you uh, uh, typed in that or some variants of that, you, that'll take you there as well. So, we will visit with you tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Uh, yeah, because we do... And uh, and there's always breaking news. In fact, uh, breaking news right now about kids feeling like they've been starved because they've only been given apples and water. And uh, I think it's I, I think the, the right wing would just say, "Well, you're at camp." Okay. Well, I don't know. We had burgers and hot dogs also when I was at camp. So let's uh, listen to the rest of that breaking news on Netroots Radio all day as it breaks, and we'll visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des tiers, des photos de bord de mer. Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver